it's a great pleasure to have Hussein Ascari from the uh, Belt and Road Institute of Sweden with me here tonight to talk about the past and the future of global trade, particularly in terms of what's happening in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative, which as many of our viewers will know, is a global initiative kicked off by China in 2013, um, which has a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure implications uh, right across the globe. And my guest tonight is Hussein um, Askari, who has been uh, both a student, a researcher and a teacher um, of people across the world in terms of this particular major global policy initiative. And we're really here tonight, firstly, to hear what he has to say, to bring us up to speed. Um, and then I will ask some questions afterwards, which will hopefully uh, give us a chance to explore some issues. So over to you, Hussein. Thank you very much, Professor Warwick. I'm uh, very happy to be with you. Uh, of course, I'm not a formal teacher or a student. I, uh, I'm a member of a uh, the International uh, Schiller Institute uh, for many, many years, 22 years now. Uh, and uh, I'm also uh, the vice chairman of the Belt and Road uh, Institute in Sweden. My interest in the new Silk Road started already in 1995-96 when I worked on the first uh, thorough report on what are the implications. Uh, this was a Schiller Institute uh, project. What are the implications of connecting the continents with infrastructure uh, networks uh, for the world economy? What would that mean for the world economy? And of course, this is a, a, a revolution, but since 2013, when China launched the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, our work uh, you know, was magnified and there was need for people to explain, you know, the, the details, the implications on a national, regional, and global level of what happens when you build these networks. And therefore we were way ahead of people, but then people caught, caught up with us in different sectors, people who are better than us in railways, there are people better than us in shipping, uh, people who are better than us in uh, green technology or in uh, digital technology and so on. So we are not specializing what we look at the whole picture, as you see in my, the map behind me. This is our concept of the connectivity. This is a realistic map. It's not an artistic one because it's based on many years of research in many, many different countries on their own national development plans. And then we integrate their national development plans into the larger picture, into the regional plans, into the global plans. And therefore, these are realistic. Actually, if you go by GIS, you can find out that these are very accurate <laughs> uh, to the level of where the railways go or roads or... Anyway, I, uh, I, uh, let me share with you... Um, one second, I will share with you my screen. So you see what I'm talking about. Uh, Fantastic, we have that clear on the screen. Okay. Right, so this is a, a report I wrote with colleagues or a book. Uh, it's called Extending the New Silk Road to West Asia and Africa. Uh, we use the term West Asia instead of Middle East because it's more scientific. Uh, but then the big focus of the uh, report, as you see on the cover, is on uh, China's uh, cooperation with African nations. Yeah. Uh, before we go into the digital uh, aspect of things, because what we look at is we look at the, uh, the physical economics of any economy. Physical economics is the basic infrastructure, the human resources, the water resources, the minerals, the scientific technological level, which is a very important criteria, which is not looked at when people measure GDP. For example, the Chinese GDP is by dollars is lower than the American GDP. But if you look at the industrial and scientific activities going on in China, in general, are much, much larger than the American. So the GDP can mean different things, but people don't look at technological and scientific levels of a society when they measure where this society is going. These are the things we measure. So anyway, when I look at this question of the digitalization, 
First of all, I mean, we have the basics uh, reports by the uh, OECD and the World Bank say that, you know, that there has been a leap in Africa in digitalization, uh, which is normal because Africa wants to catch up with things, but going from zero, always you can make double, triple, quadruple very easy. But going from 50 to 60, that's a big uh, issue. Anyway, so the reports say that uh, Africa's total inbound international internet bandwidth capacity increased by more than 50 times. That is from almost zero. Uh, the operations fiber optic networks extended by almost four times. Mobile cellular subscriptions more than doubled and about 58% of the population now live in areas covered by 4G networks. Uh, because the, the Africa leapfrogged to, for, to mobile you know, technology because that you didn't have the, 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 uh, the uh, conventional telephone networks. Africa has for over 480 million mobile money accounts, more than all the developing uh, regions taken together. That also has its uh, aspect because most Africans don't have bank accounts, therefore they need to use um, you know, money accounts on their mobiles. Uh, more than 500 African companies provide technology enabled innovation in financial services, fintech. Uh, the valuation of some African startups exceeds a billion dollars. Over 640 tech hubs are active across the continent. Then the report says beyond digital infrastructure development, this is uh, talking about the negative side. It says, however, most digital success stories remain exceptional. Innovations uh, hardly trickle down to the real economy and create too few jobs. Over 26% of rural dwellers use the internet regularly. That's only 26%. So you have like 74 who don't use internet, 74%. Uh, compared with 47% of the urbanized. In 37 African countries, more than 50% of the population cannot afford one gigabyte of data per month. And only 31% of all African firms have their own website. Then it says, the World Bank says that uh, uh, 300 million Africans are farther than 50 kilometers away from the nearest broadband or optic fiber network. That's the nearest one to you is 50 kilometers in average. So you don't really have access. Uh, and then, which is the big issue, is that 600 million Africans don't have access to electricity. And that's my big argument with people who talk about the fourth industrial revolution in Africa. But I said, well, how can you have a fourth industrial revolution when you don't have electricity? You cannot have computers. You cannot have. Uh, even mobile phones or anything without electricity. So we have to look at these things first, uh, but not, I mean, first, but you have to do it in parallel. You have to develop the basic infrastructure first to allow this re digital revolution to really take hold. Now on the positive side, we have uh, the, the population of Africa. Some people think it's negative. I think it's positive. We have, there are 1.3 billion people in Africa now. By 2050, it, the estimate is that it will increase to 3 billion people uh, living in Africa, but 60% would be below the age of 25 years. That's the youngest population on the planet. If you look at Europe, Germany, for example, the average, the median age of a citizen already today is 49 years. In Africa, it's below 20. Uh, so you will have a very young population. You already have a young population in Africa, which is, has a huge appetite for digital technology, but it lacks the basic economic infrastructure, uh, which I will uh, talk about now. So, okay, how do I move to the next one? Okay. Uh, we are still in the digitalization. I looked at some interesting uh, websites where you can follow the, all the submarine cables in the world, which provide us with all, almost all the internet we have. Uh, these are real 
uh, cables. Uh, this is not like an artist imagined it. You can go to this website and click on e every one of these different uh, lines and you will find who is supporting it, uh, who built it, and so you have very good uh, 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 picture of each one of these. And these are, it's mostly uh, run or owned by Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, and so on and so forth, but different uh, uh, telecommunications companies of the world uh, also own shares in this. So this is a really global village, you know, where every nation in the world can connect to this and have a share in it. But there are the big players uh, and uh, you have the small players, uh, depending on the advancement of the cap capability to have, you know, uh, telecommunications uh, technologies and uh, building, building the cables themselves. Now, 10% of these are not Chinese, these are global, these are global networks. So these are not Chinese yet. But China has a 10% share in the in average in this whole global uh, network, uh, which already connects a East Asia with Africa, with the West Asia, with the Mediterranean and Western Europe. The, the Chinese companies have 10% stake in these international, uh, but this is 10%, it was like zero around uh, less than 20 years ago. So this is a big uh, advancement. And the big uh, players in China, the, in the global, the Chinese players in the global are the China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, and so on and so forth. But now China is developing because it is now mastering the art of building these digital cables or these uh, submarine cables and the digital technology from A to Z. Now China is developing its own networks. Also there are strategic aspects of this because you know, for geopolitical reasons, China could get cut off like uh, Russia today is being cut off from financial systems. China could easily get cut off from the digital systems of the globe. Uh, so therefore China is building its own. This is called the Peace um, uh, Cable, which is uh, built by Chinese, uh, by Chinese companies. And it connects uh, you know, East uh, Asia to, uh, we have Pakistan, uh, there's a hub. We have the UAE, there's a hub, United Arab Emirates, but then East Africa. In Egypt, there are two, one cable, submarine cable was, was, but also one was overland cable. And then it reached into France. So China is developing its own independent uh, cable network. Uh, this is have become more and more important. Now you, we discussed earlier the question of which you are interested in also on the digital commerce, uh, digital trade. You have in, this is where it's growing more than any place on earth is inside China, but in China's vicinity, the Southeast Asian countries, the ASEAN, because it, both because of the proximity to China uh, but also you have all the infrastructure uh, to be able to do that. So therefore the e-commerce uh, increased double between 2019 and 2020. Uh, and then it more than doubled again, but also the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic played a role in increasing the volume, but it, you could see already it was going uh, sorry, it was, it, this is the projection for the future, but it, with or without the pandemic, uh, you can have a, an explosion that this trade, this type of trade has no limits, basically. Uh, what the limits are, are the physical limits of trade, transport, logistics, and the product, the availability of the products you want to buy. Now, today we have a food shortage in the world because of the crisis in Ukraine. So if, even if you have the digital means of trading and food, if the food is not there, it's, it's gonna be difficult. Or if the transport routes are blocked, if there's a war somewhere in the, the, uh, the, Arab, the, the, the Gulf, the Hormuz Strait could be blocked or the Bab el-Mandeb 
strait could be blocked and the Red Sea, then you will have uh, all the digital trade you have will have will be in trouble. So there are many different aspects of this. It's not only having the digital trade. It's not only having the ability to, to order something. The issue is where this product comes from, how it's produced, how it is transported. And therefore, this is the image of Africa we use often is that African nations, because of the colonial heritage, African nations are disconnected from each other. Uh, all the railways were colonial railways meant to take extract raw materials or from plantations to the nearest port outside Africa. So instead, what is needed is to integrate Africa. Uh, World Bank report in 2008, uh, you know, it looked at the trade, inter-African trade, that's trade between African countries themselves is only 13% of all African trade. Uh, 87% of African trade is the, with the outside world. And the World Bank says, if we only upgrade the existing routes in Sub-Saharan Africa, only upgrading, not building high-speed rail, not building highways, only if we upgrade to a reasonable level, trade would increase among African nations by mostly by 500 to 1,000%. That's remarkable. <laughs> yeah. If only if you do that, if you connect the African countries together with basic roads. So then we have the other issue without which you cannot have digital or digitalization is the, the lack of electricity, lack of access to electricity. And you can see that the nations who are farther from the sea are the nations who are the poorest in that sense. I mean, we have big discrepancies in Africa because in Northern Africa, North Africa, you see it is, a, you know, you have almost total access to electricity uh, and also in South Africa. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Great Lakes region, I mean, it, it, ironically, uh, Rwanda is being, uh, is becoming the digital hub of all Africa in a sense, but you have big problems with it, providing electricity there. So this has to be taken into consideration when you think about future plans for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, for digitalization and trade and so on. So the, the, I mean, the priorities of the UN uh, Sustainable Go uh, Development Goals for 2030 are reasonable because they start with ending poverty, ending hunger, providing healthcare, education, gender equality, clean water, uh, energy, industrial capacity, all these things. Uh, and uh, in that sense, you know, these things are not really priorities in Europe or the United States, ending hunger or poverty, because Europe and the United States have gone beyond that level. And therefore China is attractive for Africans because Af China, people still remember when they were hungry. Yeah, when sure. there were no roads, when there, were, there is no electricity. So yeah. they understand that this is what you need to fix. European American approaches, they know you have to end uh, corruption, you have to, to democratize, you have to have equality among the genders and then everything will be fine. <laughs> this, is, this is the uh, European American approach. That's not really true. And therefore, Africans tend to want to work with China because as a developing nations, which managed to go from a very poor country to the second economy in the world uh, is very fascinating. And in 2015, President Xi Jinping in the China-Africa Forum for Cooperation, the FOCAC, he made very remarkable uh, statements because he said Africa should industrialize. That's your way out of poverty. Now, you would never hear a European or American statesman who would say that. He would rather say, no, you should not industrialize because as Obama told the students in South Africa, if you, everybody in Africa has a car, a villa, an air conditioning, the world will boil over. That's what Obama told Africans. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, but President Xi Jinping says we should, you should industrialize and it's possible Africa has enormous promise 
enormous human and natural resources uh, to do that. Of course, you have to do it in a way which does not damage uh, the climate. And then he talks about the three bottlenecks of developments that Africa needs to resolve. And these are the shortage of capital, shortage of skilled labor, and lack of infrastructure. And he said, if Africa can solve these three, then Africa can launch into the future as a great continent. And he said, of course, China will be willing to help uh, in these three, but that would not be enough for all of Africa. So China has invested in infrastructure in the first years after his speech, 60 billion, there will be 60 billion more. Uh, that's to solve the shortage of capital. We had the other bottleneck is the, the skilled labor. Uh, China has actually uh, surpassed both the United States and the United Kingdom in the number of students, African students studying abroad. Uh, so China receives more African students than both the United States and the UK. Only France, because of its history with Africa, is still the leading country where African students go to study. But then the Chinese, when they build these projects, they, what they tend to do is they educate the local labor to run these projects. These are the ladies who run now the uh, Nairo Mo Mombasa Nairobi Railway. They've got courses in China. A few of them, I heard them on TV speak Chinese. Yeah. They learned very quickly. And uh, because you, you cannot afford to have Chinese engineers working in African countries, that Chinese labor and engineers have become very expensive. Yeah. So you have to train the local. Uh, then the lack of infrastructure in 2014, uh, uh, Prime Minister Li Qiang was both in East Africa and uh, West Africa and promised African nations to work with them to connect all African nations with railways. Uh, this is a bad, these are not Chinese plans, these are African plans. This is the Trans-African Highway uh, Network, which has been on the drawing board since the 1980s from the Lagos uh, plan, 1982, but it was never built. But the other thing which we learned from China, it's actually for long haul, it's better to use railways than trucks. Mm -hmm. It's more economical and it's more beneficial for societies. So China has promised to solve also the problem with the lack of infrastructure. But as I said, China alone cannot solve the problems of Africa. We need Europe, the United States, Japan, India, everybody involved in this. And China made record achievements uh, like the uh, Djibouti um, Addis Ababa railway. It was built in three years on, only. And this is part of an Ethiopian national development plan. This is not a Chinese plan, once again. China goes to those countries and tells them, what is your national plan? What can we help with? What, how we can benefit both of us on this? This is a, a plan to build eight major industrial zones. There are three of them are built now in cooperation with China. They produce uh, textiles, uh, produce auto parts, even cars, Chinese cars are produced in Ethiopia and so on. So these are national development plans. We had, the, as I showed you, the Mombasa uh, 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 Nairobi Railway. This is part of a larger Af East African plan to connect all the East African countries with the Great Lake nations. It's called the East Africa Master Plan. And China is, is, is on the way to help with that, but it's working with each national government alone, not working with all the group together because each nation has its own specific condition. We had the uh, railway connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean uh, from Angola to, uh, to, to DRC, Zambia and Tanzania. It was also uh, built. And then there is the idea to connect all the rivers and lakes of Africa to use them for as a transport corridors. And it's possible from an engineering standpoint actually we have discussed with engineers, like the one you have in Europe from the Black Sea, you have the Danube, uh, Rhine mine, uh, can, you know, the mine canal, which connects the two rivers. And you can take uh, these uh, container ferries all the way from the Black Sea to the North Sea. Well, if you're in Germany, you can see always on the rivers, you have all these flat ships. <laughs> Uh, so this is possible in Africa too. 
And then we have to short the shortage of, uh, infra of electricity. There are massive plans. Africa has uh, the capacity to about 100,000 megawatts of hydropower, which is not developed. One of the biggest projects is on the Congo River. It's called the Grand Inga Dam, which is a series of dams, not only one dam, but there are like seven, eight dams you can build to generate 40,000 megawatts of power. That's double the size of the Chinese Three Gorges Dam. You will have electricity enough for the Congo and its neighbors. So these projects have been sleeping there, but the recently Chinese and Spanish companies got into a, some sort of a, a memorandum or understanding. Uh, we have also the potential for the development of nuclear power in Africa, which is a, people think it's controversial. How can you have nuclear development? And this is a, South Africa already has a developed uh, nuclear you know, uh, program. It needs to be improved and supported. You, have, you can have new technologies, fourth generation, these pebble bed uh, uh, reactors which China is now developing too. So this is where the future is. Uh, Egypt is uh, building both a, a, a major uh, nuclear power complex uh, in the west part of the, city, of the country, but more interestingly, it's building a school, a high school for nuclear technology. Young people, 16, 17 years old, they go a three years course to learn how to run and manage nuclear power plants. This is unique in the whole world, actually. Mm. So you'll have hundreds and probably thousands of young men who can be technicians, not engineers, but technicians, but then they can go study to become real scientists and engineers. This is a very uh, ambitious program uh, by, uh, by Egypt. Uh, Egypt is, have a contract with Russia to build the, something similar to this, four reactors, uh, 1,250 megawatts each, which is quite large. And uh, both Russia and China have nuclear technology agreements with many countries. So this is the whole this story I wanted to convey that if you don't have, this is the lesson we learned from China. You cannot develop the country. Yes, you can open free industrial zones and the ports so foreign companies can come and use your cheap labor. But for real development, you have to build massive infrastructure uh, projects to connect the countries, to produce electricity, to manage the water systems, to educate and provide healthcare to, uh, to African nations. And I think the, the ambitions of Africa and, and also the willingness of China to do that uh, are quite synchronized in a sense. And this is the image I always use uh, because uh, I asked a, a friend of mine, an artist, to look at my book and see if we build all these projects we mentioned in the book, how would Africa look by nighttime compared to what it is today? This is from 2015. Uh, a NASA picture, the one to the left. This is how Africa looks nighttime. And you can compare it to the Europe, a bit north of it. But if we, you know, by 2050, Africa could look completely different uh, than what it is uh, today. So this is what we talk about is, if you don't develop the physical economic basis for a modern society, all this talk about, the fourth uh, industrial revolution, digitalization, digital trade, as I showed you, you can order things from another African country, but it will never arrive because there are no roads. And therefore these, these things have to go uh, along each other uh, in the in this discussion of development. So I stopped there and uh, well, I, I'm sure you, you have lots of questions. Look, I don't even know where to start, but um, thanks very much for that um, very big picture rapid overview, because if anybody watching this did not appreciate both the challenges and the opportunities of the African continent, um, I'm sure they do now. Um, and uh, uh, we have a great team in South Africa, and I learn new things every day and every week working with them about the challenges and the opportunities of that part of the world. 
A couple of things about what you said struck me that I'd be curious about in terms of your thinking. Uh, and they both go really towards questions of timelines. Um, one comment you made was about um, the, the history, which is that there have been plans in the past, but nothing happened. Um, and then the other thing that struck me was your comment about the projections on both population size into the future and the demographic composition of that population, the youthfulness of that population. And I'd be interested in your perspectives on what you think the next 10, 20 and 40 years is likely to start to look like and what it is that people within Africa and around the world who are doing business and trading with Africa can perhaps look forward to. I can't, I can't I put on the blinders, it's too strong, too bright. <laughs> you, might need, you might need the sunglasses by the sound. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it is quite cold here right now. It's uh, always still below zero so most of the time and some it, on during the day it goes above zero but it's still cold but the when the sun hits right into your face you need sunglasses true no i think the for the uh, uh the, the question of history uh, and plans and so on uh that there has been many disappointments in africa since the independence in the 60s there are big setbacks uh, but people always keep this hope into the future. And since the populations are young, there's always this urge to go forward, not look back uh, at history. And I think this is the greatest wealth Africa has, which is the young population. Uh, and as I said, it's both in terms of the ability, all the magnitude, the number of young people, which would be like how much, one point. 5 billion young people below 23 years, that's a huge uh, you know, uh, resource, uh, whereby if you provide the infrastructure, the education, the healthcare for those young Africans, then they would be the, not the, so people don't misunderstand me, Africa could become the factory of the world, uh, like China is today not like a slave labor or something, but China, but Africa could become the real workshop of the world and uh, produce food for itself and the world It can produce other materials. And uh, that of course will lead to tension because Africans would need to use the raw materials of their own continent for their own industrial process. But they, like China does today, it's sharing it with the rest of the world. And therefore there should be a system of cooperation among nations. I think the Belt and Road Initiative is a very good way of working together uh, because China is sharing technology, is sharing financial resources and know-how with other nations to rise uh, from where they are now today. And on that basis, you can have a, a similar mechanism for, I mean, it's, everything is built on trust. You know, you, can, you cannot have an agreement uh, that if you become rich, you should not treat me like this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. This is not uh, uh, this is not how the world should work. But there should be some mechanism for uh, regulating relations among nations, transfer of technology, uh, mutually beneficial projects. Uh, and I think Africa is so large and needs so much. Many nations can actually work many, many, many years before reach a, we reach a point where we would have like a conflict uh, over who controls what in Africa. I think those nations should remain sovereign and independent in a sense and work together as a unity, but then uh, they should establish friendly relations with, the, with other powers. So in that sense, there is a, the demographics uh, are very important in this sense and also as I said, the young people have this proneness to digital technology. Now, yeah. what, uh, I think digital technology, most of it is used for entertainment, 
but there is very useful aspects of uh, it's in trade, in education, transfer of technology. Uh, you know, the artificial intelligence is now getting into the even the running the infrastructure, uh, scientific research, uh, space exploration. All these things will be affected by uh, by this kind of uh, interaction between the young people and the environment and the scientific and technological progress around them. So there is a massive promise. I mean, in Africa, every year, as I said, you know, if you go from zero to, to 10, that's like 10 times growth. If you go to 20, this is, so you can every year, Africa can double and triple its economic activity based on the magnitude of the large, how large Africa and its population are and how great the needs are. And there's also how big the potential is. So there are really no limits how much you can develop uh, the trade, the communication, the, the internet, the digital trade and all that. There, there are no limits because Africa is still on the rise, so to speak. And the, there are huge needs for fulfilling the, the, what this young population needs. I've got a whole lot of questions, but I'll try to do them one at a time to give you an opportunity to absorb and answer them and share some of your wisdom. Um, I am struck by the map behind you and the connection points and the transit routes that that map illustrates. Now, of course, that map shows a lot of terrestrial connectivity. And there are also, as some of your previous maps showed, some undersea cables. And of course, there is shipping and aeroplanes as well. But one of the things that strikes me about a lot of the Belt and Road um, Initiative work is the emphasis on railroads as the main methodology of transportation. And the and, and so I guess my question is this, um, Africa has a lot of growth opportunity by virtue of demography and by virtue of its stage of industrial development. At the same time, the Asian markets, you mentioned the e-commerce growth potential there, also speaks to very significant demand for products and resources from all over the world. And I'm curious about how you see those two worlds physically connecting through these railway and, of course, the overseas trade infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, the, this is a whole integrated system of uh, logistics and transportation. The, the, the railways are not separate from the ports, the ports are not separate from uh, the digital systems. So I think the Belt and Road Initiative is a, a, the idea is to integrate all these uh, different modes of infrastructure into one unit and to smoothly move from the river to the land to this, you know, to the railway, to the road, to the port, to the ship, and then offload it and then use the digital system to connect all these to make everything move smoothly. You know, we have the multimodal transport means have developed very, very well. I mean, uh, in, in a way like, for example, from China to Europe, you can get, I mean, there was a race to reduce from 20 days. Uh, if you have a container going from Xi'an or Chengdu, when will it arrive in Hamburg or Duisburg? And, you know, since 2011, it went from 25 days to 20 days to 14 days. And now they are trying to cut the edges to make it 12 days or 11 days. So there's always potential for development, but it's based on developing the infrastructure itself. Uh, the, in Africa, what, you, what the biggest problem is for farmers, for example, in the sub-Saharan regions, which is rich with water, is first you don't have the electricity for refrigeration and you don't have the means to transport your products to the market. So most of the pro agricultural products are wasted especially fresh uh, products, uh, fruits and vegetables are wasted because you, you cannot keep them in refrigerators and you cannot transport them quickly to the markets where they are needed. I mean, the market is not the next neighborhood. Uh, the market could be another country, another city in your country. 
And therefore, the, the lack of infrastructure has. But there was, a, I wrote an article last year on Ethiopia. It's a fascinating story. Ethiopia, when people talk about Ethiopia in the 80s and 90s, it was always the image of famine in, Af in Ethiopia. Yeah. This is a country where you have recurring famines. Now, Ethiopia have solved that that problem, both by reforming the agricultural sector, but also building the infrastructure and the, providing technology to the farmers to produce enough food. But last year, for the first time, Ethiopia exported the avocado fruits yep. produced in Ethiopia to Holland. So they put them on refrigerated containers from an area near Addis Ababa on the railway, which was built by China, to Djibouti, where China also has developed this container terminal. And then from there, it goes by ship and remains refrigerated all the way to Holland. So this is, in a sense, it's a, a beautiful metaphor for yeah. a big revolution, which is taking place. A country which a few years ago, people only talked about famine. Now it's sending refrigerated vegetables and fruits to Europe, but along the Belt and Road. And all the trade, all the following the, the, the shipment, the customer in Holland can follow the shipment through the digital technology. Yeah. And so this is a, just one example of uh, how this is revolutionizing both the economic conditions, but also the trade on these multimodal uh, systems. So in um, say 10 years time, as I look at the map and look at the transport infrastructure connectivity that is possible across the continent. Where do you think the world could be from an African perspective in terms of connectivity from Cape Town to Cairo to Copenhagen to Chengdu? <laughs> yeah, well, that's interesting. I think 10 years is a, is a short time, but I see, I follow projects which are being built to connect regions. Uh, for example, now, uh, China, as I said, they built the, the Mombasa, in Kenya, Mombasa to, uh, to, to uh, the capital Nairobi. But from Nairobi to the border of, of Uganda, another project is being built. Inside Uganda, there's a project being built. So these things might take two, three years. And then you will have from Uganda to Rwanda, Burundi, and Eastern Congo. That's a bit more difficult process it might take up to five years but then in the west part of africa you have projects being built in nairobi and in nigeria cameroon uh, and all these countries on the western part of uh, africa uh, going south north or north south egypt has a pro uh, uh, launched a program for building highways into sudan uh, like five thousand kilometers which will bring you to the uh, great lakes regions uh, this is supposed to be completed in five years. Uh, the, in Southern Africa, we don't have the vision uh, of connectivity to, except for its own immediate neighbors, but the, the, the grand vision of connecting all African nations need, to, need a push. And I think the Chinese made a good attempt to push that into the African. And as I showed in this study of the World Bank, uh, I mean, Africa signed the, the common uh, free trade agreement uh, three years ago, or two years ago. This was a revolution that you can uh, trade uh, among the African nations without customs, without uh, all kinds of tariffs and problems. But still, the trade has not grown because there is no way of moving the, yeah. the goods between African countries. So the, the vision for connecting what you said all these African nations with Europe, with China, it, it will take a, a great deal of will by other powers, like in Europe, in the United States, to uh, Japan and, and India, that they all could work together to do that. There's a lot of geopolitics which is preventing this. I mean, there's already a big attack on the Belt and Road as an imperialist Chinese attempt to trap nations and the debt and force them to give military concessions to China. There's so much propaganda about it. So we need to solve that geopolitical problem, which is not really based on anything in reality. It's based on this old mentality of Cold War, the colonial system, 
zero sum game. And if that's not solved, it would be very difficult to imagine the world connected in that way. I mean, today we have a horrendous situation in Europe where, you know, because of the Ukraine crisis, although the gas is still flowing from Russia to Europe, the European politicians are talking as if Russia will not exist in the future. So they are burning all bridges with Russia. Uh, and of course, Russia will not disappear even when this war is ended. And we have the China uh, Europe uh, Express Railway, which I mentioned for shipping yeah. from, from, uh, from Xi'an and Chengdu through West China through Russia and Belarus. This is the main route. 97% of all trade goes through Russia and Belarus who are involved in the war. And there are sanctions imposed on them. But that's the one of the most important routes for ship for uh, sending uh, critical, especially spare parts and other things, medical equipment. I mean, it was very important during the COVID nineteen. We, I mean, we got all these PPE equipment, this medical equipment from China through these railways, because they could get there by fourteen days instead of two months by sea lines. So anyway, the the this railway between China and Europe. It now has almost disappeared. The, the volume had went to 50% immediately. And now European shipping companies, although the sanctions don't include shipping on these railways through Belarus and Russia to China, companies are saying, no, we don't like the Russians. We don't want to deal with the Russians. And even if this conflict ends, you don't know if there will be trade going on between uh, Europe and China through Russia and Belarus. Will there be gas going, you know, the other way? Sure. Uh, so there are lots of geopolitical problems which prevent this vision, this dream from being becoming a reality because it's very easy. This could be achieved, as you say, in 10 years, maybe. Look, I just want to touch on two questions that these comments um, point towards um, before letting you go back to your busy day. Um, you touched on earlier the question around uh, concerns about the issues of debt trap diplomacy, so to speak. So I'd like you to comment a little bit on that. And the last question that I'd like you to touch on, which is to bring you back to the situation in Europe at the moment, is you recently made some remarks and wrote a short article um, on the possibilities of the Belt and Road as a bridge to a peaceful future. Um, and I'd just like to hear your thoughts on both of those topics, uh, as I said before, letting you get back to your busy day. Thank you. Well, uh, the debt trap, uh, you know, I think it was buried uh, two years ago uh, because they were very important. I mean, besides our institute, I mean, I wrote about this in 2000. Uh, 18 already, uh, you know, looking at this question of Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, but then there are real important institutes uh, like the uh, the Asian, the Center for Asian Studies in the Johns Hopkins uh, University. Dr. Deborah Brautigam made a thorough study of this issue. I mean, she had debunked other myths about uh, China and Africa. I have, when I was writing my report, I showed you there was a section on agriculture and I read her book, uh, Will Africa Feed China? Because the, in 2008, 2009, when we had the food uh, crisis in the world, uh, people started spreading uh, you know, this information that China is taking over agricultural land in Africa to produce food for China. And uh, uh, you know, the, the depriving Africans from eating that food. So the, Dr. Deborah Brautigam, she traveled to Africa for several months to go to the places where this stuff was mentioned, and she found no basis for that. Uh, so now she she has become an expert on these this kind of stuff. So she did a thorough study of the debt of several countries, but especially Sri Lanka, because the port of Hambantuta became a template. In yep. my article 2018, I said this was concocted in the US State Department 
they commissioned two students of political science in the John Kennedy School in Harvard. I have a whole, I read their report. I mean, they were commissioned by the State Department to write about the threat of debt trap. So they yeah. designed a report which they sent back to the State Department and the State Department gave it to the media. And Sri Lanka, they said, the port of Hambantuta should be the template because there were no other examples, China taking over a port. What happened in that, as Dr. Deborah Prautigam shows in her study, that Sri Lanka was in de deep financial problems, not because of China, because the amount Sri Lanka had to pay back for the loan are very small. Sri Lanka had borrowed money since the end of the civil war in Sri Lanka for recovery from international bond markets, which are dominated by Western banks. Yep. and Japan. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, 2017, 2018, Sri Lanka had to pay back a lot of that debt. And instead of defaulting, they asked for help. So China, they asked, the Sri Lankan government asked Chinese, they offered the Hambantuta port for leasing internationally, not only to China, but nobody wanted to take that. The Chinese yeah. came and took the offer given by the Sri Lankan government to lease the port in return for about a billion dollars, which the Sri Lankan government used to pay the debt for the Western countries. Yeah. It's so ironical. It is very ironic. <laughs> and she says, this is, was not debt trap. This was a debt bailout. China bailed out Sri Lanka because the Sri Lankans were going to default on their debt. China helped them. But in return, they got this contract offered by Sri Lanka to lease this port. And now, by the way, this port is growing. It's a very, very strategic, important port. And actually, China has invested even more in the Colombo port, yeah. building a whole city around the Colombo port in Sri Lanka. And this is a massive. So th th there are other examples. The, the end of the story is that actually the most of the countries where China is going to build infrastructure, they are already in a debt trap. Yeah. Caused by borrowing to cover for fiscal problems or trade deficit. As I wrote in my article about the case of Pakistan, Pakistan was borrowing to cover the trade deficit. They, Pakistan was borrowing money to buy oil and gas from the Gulf countries to produce electricity to the range of $14 billion a year. And their trade deficit increased and their debt increased based on that. What China did is that building power plants to make Pakistan produce the electricity at home instead of borrowing money from British banks. I had one example, Chartered and Standard, they borrowed $1 billion one year at the interest of 4% to buy gas and oil from Qatar. Now, Pakistan can produce that electricity from the dams and power plants built by China for an investment of $20 billion, but they can produce electricity for 50 years. Yeah. So Pakistan immediately can slash $14 billion a, a year from its trade deficit. So actually, China is helping those countries pay for their debt to the Paris Club, to the IMF, and World Bank, and so on. So the issue what people don't understand there are two things you have productive credit you have to ask what are you doing with the money you are borrowing are you borrowing the money to pay old debt that's a trap that's what happens in africa that's what has been in greece you borrow money for higher and higher interest rates to pay old debt and it accumulates it becomes bigger and bigger and your economy is in a state of attrition if you borrow money to build infrastructure, electricity, agriculture, industry, that's productive credit. That the very projects you are building, they will enable you to increase your productivity and increase your income so you can sustain your debt. So there's a fallacy in looking at every loan in a similar way. Sure. No, sure. there are productive loans, there are debt traps. Yeah. Now the last question um the prospects of belt and road and trade as a bridge to yeah. a p 
peaceful settlement of the European crisis. You touched on this in some recent interviews and I'm curious about your perspectives on that, given that uh, where you are physically is of course uh, very close to the epicenter of the action. Yeah, I mean, both physically and psychologically, because you can't imagine the, the level of tension here. All of the, every day and night we have the news is all about Ukraine and the crisis in Ukraine and uh, all the doomsday scenarios people talk about. I think the, the, this war could have been prevented uh, okay. earlier if there was understanding for every party's concerns, but that's gone. Uh, now there's a possibility of a negotiated uh, solution between Ukraine and Russia. So the interests of each party are uh, preserved. The sovereignty of Ukraine, but also the neutrality of Ukraine, which Russia is demanding. Uh, so th th there is, I, 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 some people ask me, I was on Arab, Arabic TV too, about the gas problem, for example, the gas and oil problem. I mean, Europe cannot do without Russian gas and oil for the foreseeable future. This is a fact. It will be dark night in Germany, especially Italy, which very few people talk about Italy. Italy is also very reliant on, uh, and most countries in Eastern Europe who are in the shadow, they rely on Russian gas for 80, 90%. So, these economic processes and now Ukraine, as you mentioned, I mean, we had a podcast recently with two experts, one Chinese professor who has done many studies on connectivity between China and Europe. I mean, Ukraine is a fantastic location for a transport and logistics hub between uh, Asia and Europe. It's, it, it has a huge, if you look at the map, you know, Ukraine is like a real bridge and also is located on the Black Sea, has access to the Black Sea and to the West Asia, uh, Middle East. Uh, but also Ukraine has massive agricultural, but also industrial potential. I mean, in the Soviet period, Ukraine was the big industrial center, especially for space technology, aerospace. I mean, Ukraine still produces some of the largest air cargo airplanes in the world. Mm. Uh, so Ukraine has massive economic potential for an indust agro-industrial economy, but also as a bridge between, between East and West, between China, Central Asia, Russia, and the West. So these facts of life, these facts of economics, you cannot imagine Russia to disappear. <laughs> You have to find a way of coexisting with Russia, coexisting with Belarus. And I think the idea of economic connectivity becomes superior in that sense, because like we have the peace in the Middle East, you never reach peace unless you have economic development and economic relations before you reach that level of solving all the political problems. We have old political problems, historical problems. Here in Sweden, we still, because the Russians invaded the coast of Sweden in 1720, people still remember this. It's taught in school. <laughs> people will never forget that the Russians attacked us. Sweden attacked Russia in the, in the, uh, in the uh, 18th century. So the, the, you cannot solve these problems, but what you can do is you can start these steps to normalize economic relations and find what is in the benefit of every party. That was the basis for what is called the Peace of Westphalia Treaty in 1648, which ended 100 years of bloody religious wars in Europe. The treaty says every party should work for the benefit of the other. That's paradoxical. Yeah. And, that, and everything should be forgiven and forgotten. That's, I think, what will Eventually, uh, the Schiller Institute has a conference now uh, on the 9th of April with diplomats from all these countries uh, and experts to discuss what will be the shape of peace uh, after this conflict, if this conflict is achieved. And it's mostly 
based on building these economic bridges among nations. I mean, China has invested a lot in Ukraine. I was told mm -hmm. recently, it's not a well-known fact, but China does not discriminate. I mean, they have huge investments in Belarus and the Great Stone Industrial Park and the transport hubs, but they also were intending to make big investments in Ukraine. So I think this is a fantastic area where all the nations who are in conflict can work together in the same place. Well, we can only hope so. And we hope that um, the alignment of the economic material interests of peoples in different countries can create the basis of some common ground where we can find peaceful resolution to sometimes long historical differences of opinion. Look, Hussein, we could talk for a long, long time tonight. Um, I have maybe another 10 questions at least, but every time you answer a question, I have three more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we can have another meeting. But I would love to have another um, session and maybe make this a regular feature to um, get both a European perspective on um, what is happening in the world of global trade and economic development, but also a European perspective on the BRI, which I think is um, a tremendously significant global initiative, obviously at times controversial, but nonetheless leaving its mark right across the world. And I'd just like to thank you for your insights tonight, particularly in terms of what's happening on the African continent. And we'll definitely arrange another time to catch up soon. So thank you once again, Hussein, and have a fantastic day. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. I'm very happy. Right. Thank you.